Welcome everyone to this second of two Winter Women in Translation readings sponsored by PEN America and the PEN America Translation Committee. In case you missed the first reading, a recording can be found on the PEN America website. My name is Alta Lynn Price, and I am a member of the PEN America Translation Committee, which advocates on behalf of literary translators working to forward a wider understanding of their art and offering resources for those with an interest in international literature. PEN America's commitment to support women's voices in translation builds on efforts by blogger Maytal Radzinski, whose mission is to raise awareness of translated literature by women, queer, and non-binary authors. Although Women in Translation Month occurs each August and the PEN Translation Committee celebrates it with a series of readings, we simply couldn't wait this year and are proud to bring you a winter Women in Translation event. For bringing together today's stellar assemblage of translators and authors, thanks go to the three co-organizers co of this event series, Nancy Naomi Carlson, Marguerite Feitlevitz, and Catherine E. Young. I will now introduce the co-moderators for today's event. Nancy Naomi Carlson, twice an NEA Literature Translation Grant recipient, has published 12 titles, eight of which are in translation. Her book, An Infusion of Violets, published by Seagull Books in 2019, was called New and Noteworthy by the New York Times. Her translation of Karl Torabuyi and Alain Mabankou were published by, last year by Seagull Books. Marguerite Feitlevitz translates poetry, prose, and theater from French and Spanish. Her translation of Chilean poet Ennio Motedo's book, Night, was supported by an NEA fellowship and is forthcoming from World Poetry Books. Marguerite is the author of A Lexicon of Terror, Argentina and the Legacies of Torture, and teaches at Bennington College. Marguerite will take it from here. Thank you, Alta, for this fine introduction. And thanks to PEN America and the PEN Translation Committee for sponsoring this reading, and especially Alia Gatto, who is managing our tech needs this afternoon. Thanks, too, to all our author translator pairs and to everyone turning in today. I'm just delighted to be co-translating, co-moderating this event where we are presenting five translators and their authors for live bilingual readings from Bulgarian, French Canadian, Finnish, German, and Romanian. The reading will be followed by a short Q&A if time permits. So please submit your questions for any of the panelists in the comments section and we'll ask as many as we have time for at the end. During the reading, book links will be posted in the chat we encourage you to support all our readers and translators and discover more of their writing through their publications. And now on to our readers. Our first pair of readers today will be translator Hannah Allen and author Salome Assur. Hannah Allen is a Hart Performance, Comparative Literature and French major at Oberlin College and Conservatory of Music. She is a former recipient of the Marondon Fellowship from the Société des Professeurs Français et Francophones des États-Unis and was selected to participate in the 2021 Banff International Literary Translation Center. Salomé Assur studies philosophy at the Université du Québec à Montréal. Her debut novel, Un, was published in 2019 by the Montreal-based press Édition Poète de Bruce. Assur was recognized as one of Radio Canada's 10 Young Writers to Watch in 2020 and is currently working on her second novel. Please, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much for the introduction, Marguerite, and thank you everyone for the opportunity to participate in this event alongside my friend Salome and so many other wonderful translators and authors. So as Marguerite mentioned, today we'll be reading an excerpt from Salome's debut novel, Un, or One. One is a meditation on the unexpected and often unacknowledged violence of solitude. A book that defies genres and conventions, one features a first person narrator who sits at a table for one and addresses a mysterious monsieur. As a statement on the male gaze and masculinity, the M of the word monsieur is the only capitalized letter in the text. And as a form of rebellion against time and the ever present threat of endings, the book contains no punctuation other than commas. With that, I'm going to start off and Salome and I will take turns reading the original in translation. Solitude comes into your life one rainy day and never leaves. It hounds you and waits for you at every turn of a rain shower, covered in a white sheet like children asleep or even awake in broad daylight. 
for children know how to build forts with nothing but a rectangle of fabric. Solitude, better than anyone else, knows how to regain its prey. And you pretend not to be lonely, not to mind it, the reclaimed isolation we think we love. Well, what can I say? I had wrongly imagined this brokenness would disappear with time. Yes, the imagination can be wrong, rightfully so. I had wrongly imagined my solitude was appeased, disappearing the way everything disappears with age. But my God, the age stayed the same, identical to that of the torrents contemplated by the window. And oh, how the little girl I used to be drives me mad for succumbing to hope, so passionately, like a lover of the future. With time, nothing has changed. The eternal confusion of rainy days when showers of stones lapidate the hopscotch courts we stubbornly draw to defy the sky. In vain, the same chalk condemned to erasure. How could we waste our love on these deluges of the tender age, monsieur? À présent que je m'assieds sur cette enfance barricadée, je vous prie de bien vouloir de moi pour les heures qui nous sont accordées. Après tout, ce n'est qu'un bouquin, et vous en lirez d'autres, et ces autres assurément n'auront pas mon insolence. Il existe toujours mieux que soi. Voilà ce qu'il ne faut pas croire pour se laisser aimer dignement. Oui, ces autres auront meilleure mine et ne vous fracasseront ni l'imaginaire ni la raison. Je n'ai rien trouvé de mieux que cette phrase un peu longue pour me lier. Mais tout cela n'est qu'un fracas supplémentaire fabriqué par les briques depuis l'horizon qui me tombent à la renverse sur la raison. Comme je me perds, monsieur, comme je m'égare dans d'étonnants sentiers lorsque j'aimerais seulement vous trouver. J'avais l'intention de croire en vous depuis le début de ma folie. Je ne sais plus quand. Un jour, j'ai su que j'étais insensé, et ce jour-là, j'ai décidé de, de vous aimer. Oui, l'amour est une décision qui interdit aux bulles d'éclater en vide au fond du bain. Et peut-être avez-vous fermé ces pages avant ce lieu précis Peut-être ne me lirez-vous jamais le paradoxe insondable d'adresser les mots écrits sans être certain d'être lu, et sur vos yeux de n'avoir jamais la main mise, ainsi vont les plumes, légères mais chancelantes d'incertitude. Si mon malheur sur cette table s'est retrouvé, c'est qu'il me fallait l'avoir en face et de plein fouet. J'ai voulu le rendre plus abordable en l'habillant de mots pour le mettre à nu. Autre paradoxe, admettez qu'il y a de quoi devenir fou, et si j'étais sous vos yeux sous votre nez en plein dans votre visage. Si ce malheur prenait la forme d'une table pour deux, vous, le monsieur, moi, la chaise déserte, votre table pour un devant la mienne, sans doute me serait-il impossible de me pardonner ce discours de roi plus imposé que l'homicide de l'arbre. Et si l'amour est une décision, peut-on s'en retirer Ne me dites pas non, c'est ce que les fous refusent, ce que les insensés récusent. Et tout à l'heure, je vous priais de bien vouloir de moi, mais j'oubliais de préciser sans que j'y sois. Now that I sit on this barricaded childhood, I pray you to accept me for the hours that have been granted to us. After all, this is just a book, and you will read plenty of others, and those others most certainly will not have my insolence. There is always something better out there. That is what you must not believe if you want to be loved properly. Yes, those others will look better and will shatter neither your imagination nor your reason. I couldn't come up with anything better than this somewhat long sentence to hold myself together. But this is all just additional clatter produced by the bricks that fall from the sky and knock down my reason. Oh, monsieur, how I lose myself, how I lose my way in astonishing trills when all I want is to find you. I meant to believe in you from the beginning of my madness. One day, I don't remember when, I realized I was senseless, and on that day, I decided to love you. Yes, love is a decision that forbids bubbles from bursting into oblivion in the depths of a bathtub. And perhaps you close these pages before this exact spot. Perhaps you will never read me. The unfathomable paradox of writing words without knowing if anyone will read them, and never having a stranglehold on your eyes. That's the way pens go subtle but faltering with uncertainty. If my sorrow ended up on this table, it is because I needed to have it in my face and out of my hair. I wanted to make it more approachable by dressing it in words just to lay it bare. Another paradox. Admit that there is good reason to lose your mind. 
And if I was right before your eyes, right beneath your nose in the middle of your face, if this sorrow took the form of a table for two, you the monsieur, I the deserted chair, your table for one in front of mine, surely it would be impossible to pardon myself for this king's speech, more imposed than the homicide of the tree. And if love is a decision, can we back out? Don't tell me no. It is what madmen refuse, what senseless fools recuse. And just a moment ago, I prayed you to accept me, but I forgot to include in my absence. J'attends que le temps me presse, mais rien n'y fait. La lame des heures, comme un couteau sous la gorge, me passe par-dessus la tête et m'emballe, sous vide, dans un scaphandre étriqué et sans ampleur. Dans la baignoire, les bulles sont pliées en quatre sans éclater, s'étripantes en pleurs et sans ampleur. Et parcourant mes bras du bout des doigts, recroquevillés, je m'imagine ces chemins inempruntés pour peu qu'ils ne soient pas réels. Cloque boursouflée refusant de crever. Je savonne mes frissons, faute de contenance. Car à défaut d'être dans mon assiette, je suis dans la lune d'un cosmos excentrique, une lune différente de celle qui se révèle au terrien le soir. Et la tête en sachet dans une enveloppe sans timbre, je flotte dans l'absurdité de ces baignoires que l'on charge d'eau bouillante pour combler le bleu de notre vide. Chagrine vacuité des maigris jeunes ensommeillés, piètre soie et ses mains bleues de frilosité, un bleu tout droit venu du ciel, c'est-à-dire peuplé de rien du tout et où s'égarent quelques poètes sans le souci du néant. Dans le bain, je me raconte des histoires à voix basse, oui, dans mon scaphandre sous vide coinçant la bulle, D'ailleurs, ces histoires me viennent naturellement en anglais. Je n'ai su trouver mieux pour feindre l'altérité. Et sans doute, me dis-je sur la lune, lorsque je délire en monodialogue, que quelque part, quelqu'un m'entend. Sans doute, sans doute, sans doute, certaines de mes aberrations resteront devant l'éternel irrésolu, sous la table à jamais scellée en lettres piégées. Et pourquoi, lorsque je m'invente un monde, cela se fait en anglais car pour qu'il y ait berceuse, il doit y avoir deux. Et qu'en sais-je Et qu'importe Le français n'a pas non plus la réplique à mes questions. I wait for time to hurry me, but it's no use. The blade of hours goes over my head like a knife at my throat and vacuum packs me into a narrow diving suit with no depth. In the bathtub, the bubbles bend over backwards without bursting, half-heartedly weeping their hearts out. And as I curl up and peruse my arms with my fingertips, I picture these untraveled paths in the event they aren't real. A swollen blister that refuses to pop. I lather my shivers, for lack of composure. For instead of being under the weather, I am over the moon of an eccentric cosmos. A moon different from the one that reveals itself to earthlings at night. And with my head stuffed in an envelope with no stamp, I float in the absurdity of those bathtubs we charge with boiling water to fill the blueness of our void, the disconsolate vacuity of drowsy bean poles, the pitiful self with its hands blue from faint-heartedness, a blue straight from the sky, in other words, filled with absolutely nothing, where some poets untroubled by oblivion lose their way. In the bathtub, I tell myself stories in a low voice, yes, as I corner the bubble in my vacuum-packed diving suit. Besides, these stories come so naturally to me in English, I couldn't find a better way to feign their alterity. And when I babble in monodialogue on the moon, I tell myself, surely someone somewhere must hear me. Surely, surely, surely. Some of my aberrations will remain unsolved before the eternal, forever sealed in letter bombs under the table. And when I dream up a world, why is it always in English? for it takes two to justify a lullaby. And what do I know? And regardless, the French language does not have the answer to my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah and Salome. Thank you so much. Next, we will welcome translator Celia Maria Arampuro and author and illustrator Marie Ahokovu. Celia is a Finnish translator she is happy to have translated books that have been selected as Finnish Graphic Novel of the Year 2018 and the Translator of the Year 2019 by the panel of critics in the Finnish Comic Society's magazine. Mari Aokovu 
is an illustrator and, the com and a comic artist from Finland. She draws comics and illustrations for adults as well as for kids. Her magnum op opus, Oxy, has been translated into English as the first graphic novel of the Levine Querido list. She lives and works in Copenhagen, Denmark. Celia and Mari, please read to us. Thank you. Thank you for the introductions and thank you for having us. We are really excited to be here to present what is wonderful graphic novel Oxy. And since it is a graphic novel, Mari will be sharing her screen so you can see all the wonderful illustrations. And I will try to, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I will just try to share it now so everybody can say that if there's some problem, you can already write in the chats if you can't see it. So sorry, sorry, Celia. <laughs> it's good, looking good. So we'll be reading a short scene from the from the book with the protagonist Oxy and her teacher. And we will read the dialogue in English first. And then towards the end, there is a small song that Mari will be reading in Finnish and then you can follow the text on the screen as a sort of subtitle if you like and I hope you'll enjoy our reading. Why doesn't it work? Don't try to force it. Let it come naturally. I I can't do it. Focus. Aww. The song tells you everything you need. Does everything have their own song? Let's just think about this one now. Calm down, find the words. Oh, don't worry, you learn. Can you sing me one more song, please? Um, which one? I'd like to hear the one about the island. Again? It's so pretty. Hmm. Although I don't really understand it. Fine. One more song today. Älä itke pieni. Älä itke yksinäisyyttä. Älä surua itke. Pian saat levätä. Olla rauhassa. Musta saari odottaa. Siellä on aikaa olla. Siellä on. Oh, mom is calling me. Bye bye. See you tomorrow. Thank 
thank you. That was thank awesome. you so much. Thank you, Celia, Maria, and Mari. Thank you so much. Our next reader will be translator Genya Bloom, who will be reading work by Pune Ansari. Unfortunately, Pune was unable to be with us today. She's taken ill. Um, but let me read their bios. Genya Blum is a Swiss, Ukrainian, Canadian writer, translator, and dancer. Her work has been anthologized, published widely in literary journals, and received Pushcart Prize and Best of the Net nominations. Slaves of Dance, based on excerpts from her memoir in progress, was named a notable essay in the Best American Essays 2019. Pune Ansari is an Austrian-born writer and artist with Iranian roots. She studied theater, film, and media, and is based in Vienna. Her book, Hoffnun, was published by Mikrotext, Berlin, in 2017, and has been adapted into a play that will premiere in Vienna, Austria, on March 15th, 2022. Her second book is forthcoming in 2022. Genya? Yes, thank you for that. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very sorry that Pune can't be with us today. So I'll be reading in English as well as in Austrian German in what will probably be a Swiss accent. <laughs> um, I am grateful to Pune for trusting me with Hoffnung and also for the support of her publisher, Nicola Richter of Mikrotext Berlin. As we are striving to have the English translation published, um, the book's title, Hoffnung, translates to Hopen. The last letter is dropped, as many others are in the book, which is full of intentional spelling mistakes and inventive punctuation. It is based on short text first posted to Facebook and was recently adapted into a play, as you said, by Fanny Brunner in the Cosmos Theater in Vienna, and I will see Pune then, live, for our bilingual uh, reading there in the theater. So the excerpt that I've chosen to read is one of several that will appear in Hunger Mountain Review later this month. It deals with puberty, a time of striving for independence and control over one's own identity, which are basic human needs. Pune is Iranian, Austrian, and I am Ukrainian, Canadian, Swiss, Slava Ukraini. So. <clears throat> Why do adult people who were once adolescents themselves always say puberty is a difficult time for adolescents because they're having an identity crisis, an exciting time and upheavals and don't know their bodies. Well, that isn't true. It's a psychologist's fairy tale. The adult lobby has bought into it in order to stay in power. On the contrary, humans going through puberty feel lousy because they're more and better informed about themselves and lay claim to individuality, but at the same time still live at home with their unworldly parents who hallucinate that they need to tell you that fruit is healthy after four years of biology at the end of compulsory state stipulated schooling that you should dress warmly in winter, et cetera, degrading the intelligence of their own child with their own fear of loss, obfuscating, hanging on in desperation idiocy. Besides, young people feel lousy because the love shit has started. <clears throat> Warum sagen die erwachsenen Leute, die selber schon Jugendliche waren, immer, dass die Pubertät eine schwierige Zeit für Jugendliche sein soll, weil sie eine Identitätskrise, eine aufregende Zeit und Umbrüche hätten und sich mit ihren Körpern nicht auskennen würden? Das stimmt alles nicht. Das ist ein Märchen der Psychologen, das sich die Erwachsenenlobby bei ihnen gekauft hat, um an der Macht zu bleiben. 
Menschen in der Pubertät geht es deshalb schlecht, weil sie sich im Gegenteil mehr und besser auskennen mit sich selber und Anspruch auf Individualität erheben oder gleichzeitig noch zu Hause bei den weltfremden Eltern wohnen, die halluzinieren. Sie müssen einem sagen, dass Obst gesund ist nach vier Jahren Biologie am Ende der staatlichen Pflichtschulzeit dass man sich warm anziehen soll im Winter etc., die Intelligenz des eigenen Kindes herabwürdigen, mit die eigenen Verlustängste, vernebelndem Verzweiflungsfesthalte Blödsinn. Außerdem geht es Jugendlichen deshalb schlecht, weil die Liebesscheiße beginnt. Even if you're lucky enough to be cool, have a perceptible face that doesn't dissolve and deceive him when you get slammed in dodgeball by the dodgeball in front of him or her, in front of everyone, you still have your parents during graduation the ceremony, you have to pray they'll keep it together and don't bury your dignity in the ground. Finding them embarrassing is cutting the cord, it's normal. You have no flat, No, even halfway decent privacy. You have to go to the park to take drugs or have sex or wait until you have the place to yourself in order to breathe for a moment. You're financially dependent. You have to play pretend. You don't want conflict or conversation. If you're having a lousy five minutes, you have to conceal it or they'll worry for two years. Selbst wenn man Glück hat, cool zu sein, ein sichtbares Gesicht zu haben, das einem nicht in Talg zerfließt, wenn man im Völkerball den Völkerball draufgesetzt kriegt, vor ihm oder ihr, vor allem, hat man noch immer die Eltern. Auf dem Abschlussfest muss man beten, dass sie es zusammenhalten und einem die Würde nicht im Boden eingraben. Dass sie einem peinlich sind, ist Abnabelung, ist normal. Man hat keine Wohnung, keine gescheite Privatsphäre. Man muss im Park gehen, um Drogen zu nehmen oder Sex zu haben oder die Sturmfreiheit abwarten, um kurz aufzuatmen. Man ist finanziell abhängig. Man muss sich verstellen, wenn man keinen Wickel will oder Gespräche. Wenn es einen fünf Minuten schlecht geht, muss man verstecken. Sonst machen sie sich zwei Jahre lang Sorgen. <lacht> I didn't have a problem of not knowing my body. I just found it inadequate and ugly. That's normal. Later, you simply get used to things, can't do anything about. Anyway, people who say that have it wrong. No teenager I know knew describes their inner life that way. They should actually know it. They were teens themselves once, but probably teens as we know them today are a more recent manifestation from the 20th century. Industrialization, pop culture, I don't know. Ich hatte kein mich nicht auskennen Problem mit meinem Körper. Ich habe ihn einfach nur unzulänglich und schier gefunden, ist normal. Später gewöhnt man sich einfach an die Sachen, man kann eh nichts machen. Jedenfalls, Leute, die das sagen, sind daneben. Kein Jugendlicher, den ich kenne, kannte, beschreibt so sein Innenleben. Sie müssten es eigentlich wissen, sie waren ja selber schon mal Teenies. Aber wahrscheinlich sind Teenies, wie wir sie heute kennen, eine jüngere Erscheinung aus dem 20. Jahrhundert. Industrialisierung, Popkultur, ich weiß nicht. <lacht> They just don't get it that you no longer need them as badly. Basically, they're just afraid of dying alone. That you're becoming more independent, have your own life, no longer listen to their opinions, notice their mistakes, and they're losing control over you. They slip further and further inexorably into the position where you have contact with them on a voluntary basis. And it's decided contingent on their behavior, whether they're an authority for you or not. It finishes them off. That one changes, it finishes them off. But to accept that and to pronounce, my child is breaking up with me, It's slipping away from me. It's psychologically too hard for them. It is hard. And it's classic to label people crazy somehow because they don't do what you want, which is why they blame everything on hormones that are playing crazy on you. Being uninformed, disabled somehow, having a difficult phase during which you need sympathy. 
Sie packen es nur nicht, dass man sie nicht mehr so arg braucht. Sie haben im Grunde Angst, dass sie doch alleine sterben. Dass man unabhängiger wird, sein eigenes Leben hat, nicht mehr auf ihre Meinung hört, Fehler bei ihnen entdeckt, sie die Kontrolle über einen verlieren, sie unaufhaltsam immer mehr in die Position rutschen, wo man freiwillig mit ihnen Kontakt hat und es sich anhand ihres Verhaltens entscheidet, ob sie für einen eine Autorität sind oder nicht, macht sie fertig. Dass man sich ändert, macht sie fertig. Aber das so wahr zu haben und so auszusprechen, mein Kind macht mit mir Schluss, es entgleitet mir, ist ihnen psychisch zu schwer. Es ist ja schwer und es ist ein Klassiker, Leute irgendwie für verrückt zu erklären, weil sie nicht das machen, was man will. Deswegen schieben sie alles auf die Hormone, die verrückt spielen, darauf, dass man sich nicht auskennt, irgendwie behindert ist, eine schwierige Phase hat, in der man Verständnis braucht. Who needs sympathy? I hate sympathy. For the sake of convenience in the status, I've given autocomplete a little bit of precedence, hence the bent upper, lower case, etc. in part. Hope that everything here is generally not too bad. Wer braucht Verständnis? Ich hasse Verständnis. Ich habe bei diesem Status der Bequemlichkeit halber der Autovervollständigung bis sie den Vortritt gelassen. Deshalb die gebückte Groß-Kleinschreibung und so weiter. Teilweise hoffe, dass es generell hier alles nicht zu schlimm. Thank you. Thank you, Genya. And our best thoughts go out to Pune for her swift recovery. I'm going to step aside now and Nancy Naomi Carlson will take over these introductions and manage the Q&A if there is time after the readings. Thank you. Nancy. Thank you, Marguerite. And thank you for doing such an outstanding moderating job with your Finnish pronunciations. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and such a pleasure to hear all the readers today. Our next pair of readers will be translator Sean Cotter and writer Magda Carnici. Sean Cotter is a translator from Romanian, including an award-winning edition of Nikita Stunescu's poetry, Wheel with a Single Spoke, Archipelago Books 2012. His version of Mircea Curturescu's Solenoid will be published this year. He is Professor of Literature and Translation Studies at the University of Texas at Dallas. Magna Carnici is an acclaimed writer and art critic in Romania and a leading voice of her generation. She is the recipient of many prizes and grants, including the Getty Trust and 2013 the Opera Omnia Career Prize from the Romanian Writers Union. Her poems have been translated into 13 languages. Welcome, Sean and Mati. Thank you, Nancy, for this generous uh, presentation of both of us. I will start by um, saying a few words about uh, the book we worked together, me and Sean. Uh, the book is uh, entitled Fem, and this is this is the Romanian version, and this is the American version, and it is a book about femininity, as you may, may uh, suppose from the title Fem, um, and it is. A rather strange book. It's a mixture of literary genres, like um, uh, fragments of prose, um, a personal diary, essay, poetry, uh, visions, all put together so that um, Sheherazade, which is the the main character of the book. Um, be able to tell to her boyfriend who is on the point to leave her uh, 
about her inner life and her um, evolution as a female um, person from uh, childhood to the adulthood. And um, this, um, the, the book tries to present visions and dreams and coincidences and special states of mind and of uh, uh, feeling that occur in everybody, but um, we do not uh, recognize them, or we do not remember them, and uh, it is the task of a writer to try to put them in words so that they be um, available to everybody. I'm uh, very grateful to Sean Carter for the fact that he accepted, he wanted to translate this book, which is a book written by a female writer about the feminine condition. And he did it um, uh, marvelously. And I want also to, to thank um, Will Evans, who is the director of the Deep Vellum Publishing House, for the fact that he uh, took this opportunity to publish this book, which is not an easy book, so to say. And um, I also am grateful to Pan America for, for inviting me to, to this uh, reading. Um, we, um, we chose, uh, Sean and me, um, a strange fragment of the book, which relates a dream. And um, you will see why it is strange. Uh, and I invite Sean now to start reading it if he wants. I have from time to time an odd dream I can't understand. I, as a woman, am making love in the position a man usually takes. I am on top, I embrace, I caress, I kiss. I enter someone rhythmically, some body, but I can't see who. It's dark, I'm bathed in a warm, deep silence. I'm in the middle of a wide and, how can I put it, a prehistoric bed at the bottom of an old archaic cavern. And there is no one else. I'm alone. It's like I'm making love to myself. I embrace myself. I penetrate myself. I love myself. Or maybe I'm making love to the dark. The darkness is alive, palpable. I rub it. I form it. I smack it with a kind of tender spite. The tension rises as does the excitement, the fury. I don't feel with my entire skin anymore, with its softness and its frisson of every type, as I do when I make love as a woman. The liquid magic I once felt is concentrated now into a single point, in the burning mad tip of my masculine sex. It forgets everything else and wants to finish at any price, to discharge itself, to free itself. Visez din când în când un vis ciudat, pe care nu-l înțeleg. Parcă se face că eu, o femeie, fac dragoste în postura clasică de bărbat. Sunt deasupra, îmbrățișez, mângâi, sărut, intru ritmic în cineva, într-un corp, dar nu văd în cine. E întuneric în jur, o tăcere caldă și adâncă mă scaldă, Sunt în mijlocul unui pat larg și, cum să spun, preistoric, așezat pe fundul unei caverne bătrâne, arhaice. Și nu e nimeni cu mine. Sunt singură. Fac dragoste cu mine însă. Mă îmbrățișez, mă pătrund, mă iubesc. Sau poate fac dragoste cu întunericul. Întunericul e viu. E o materie modelabilă. Îl frământ, îl plămădesc, lovesc în el cu un fel de furie tandră. Tensiunea urcă, ca și excitația, furia. Nu mai simt cu pielea toată, cu moleșeala și frisoanele ei de toate felurile, ca atunci când fac dragoste ca femeie. Magia topită pe care o simțeam altă dată s-a concentrat acum într-un unic punct, în vârful fierbinte, înnebunit, 
al sexului meu masculin, care uită de rest și vrea cu orice preț să termine, să se descarce, să se elibereze. And when I reach the climax, when I catch fire like a rocket and release all that burns within, when I explode and discharge this fast, unbearable energy, something unexpected happens. The cloud of melted coals stops at the base of my abdomen. It does not go out, but turns inward and upward through my body, through the organs, toward my head. I feel a small wave within warm and disturbing, that retreats like a sheet of hot water from my arteries and veins, nerves and tissues, and wants to climb higher and higher up to my brain. And the moment it reaches my head, in the middle of my cranium, there is a sudden luminous explosion, a blinding discharge, and I wake up. I'm in my bed, it's night, I am flooded with a powerful joy. I do not know who I am, I'm only a boundless consciousness that fills the darkness around me. I am the whole darkness, warm, living, conscious, that is one with the universe, also warm, also living, also conscious. Și când să ajung la punctul culminant, când să iau foc ca o rachetă și să arunc din mine cei mai ardent, când să explodez și să mă descarc de energia asta iute, insuportabilă, se întâmplă ceva neașteptat. Jerba de gelatec topit se oprește în josul pântecului meu, nu mai iese afară, ci o ia înapoi și în sus, de-a lungul trupului, prin interiorul organelor, înspre cap. O simt ca un mic val untric, cald și fremătător, care se retrage ca o pânză de apă fierbinte din artere și vene, nervi și țesuturi și vrea să urce în sus, în sus, până la creier. Și în momentul în care ajunge în cap, în mijlocul craniului, brusc o explozie luminoasă izbucnește acolo, o descărcare orbitoare și mă trezesc. Sunt în pat, e noapte, o bucurie puternică mă inundă. Nu mai știu cine sunt. Sunt doar o conștiență nelimitată care umple întunericul din prejur. Sunt întunericul tot, cald, viu, conștient, care e una cu Universul și el, cald, viu, conștient. Then sometimes I dream about a pregnant man. Darling, he is good-looking, a well-made man, a bit like you, but with particular eyes, tender, emotional, with a golden, playful glint. His long, wavy hair hangs down to the small of his back. He walks about the room, his odd knot hanging flaccid and childish between his thighs. I look at his swollen abdomen. He has a stomach round as an enormous ball, with stretched and shining skin. From time to time, the man rubs his abdomen in pleasure, and he holds it from below with his large, powerful hands, gingerly, carefully. His body has a bizarre but complete beauty. I caress his stomach slowly. I feel tender, delicate kicks inside. I feel a perfect satisfaction, a deep joy, as though I were the cause of that wonder. The man, for his part, also seems happy with what is happening to him, like a fruit that has finally produced seeds, like a galactic spiral that has finally located its mysterious center. Exhilarated like a pagan god in his fulfilled body, charmed by himself as any other pregnant creature would be, anyone who carries a new being inside, a new world, a new universe. Now he knows. He will give birth to a better humanity. One more beautiful, gentler. He will start by giving birth to a daughter. Apoi, uneori visez un bărbat însărcinat. Dragule, e un bărbat arătos și bine făcut, cam ca tine, dar cu niște ochi speciali, 
tandri, emoționali, plini de o licărire aurie și jucăușă. Părul lui lung și buclat îi atârnă pe spate până spre talie. Se plimbă gol prin cameră, încoace și încolo, nodul lui ciudat dintre coapse atârnă flasc și copileros. Îi privesc pântecul umflat, are o burtă rotundă, ca o minge enormă, cu pielea întinsă și lucitoare. Bărbatul își mângâie pântecul din când în când cu plăcere și îl susține de jos cu palmele mari și puternice, grijuliu și atent. Trupul lui mi se pare de o frumusețe bizară, dar desăvârșită. Îl mângâi și eu încetișor pe pântic, simt în el zvâgnete dulci, delicate. Are un sentiment de mulțumire perfectă, de bucurie adâncă, de parcă eu aș fi pricina acelei minuni. Bărbatul pare la rândul lui fericit de ce îi se întâmplă, ca un fruct care și-a produs în sfârșit sâmburele, ca o spirală galactică ce și-a fixat în fine centrul misterios. Exultă ca o zeitate păgână în trupul lui, în fine împlinit, încântat de sine, ca orice creatură gravidă care poartă înăuntru o nouă ființă, o nouă lume, un nou univers. Acum știe, va naște o umanitate mai bună, mai frumoasă, mai blândă. Va naște mai întâi o fetiță. Thank you very much. Thank you, Magda. Thank you, Sean, for this very steamy reading. And our final pair of readers is translator Ekaterina Petrova and author Jana Bukova. Ekaterina Petrova holds an MFA in Literary Translation from the University of Iowa. She is the recipient of an Iowa Arts Fellowship, fellowships from Art OMI, the Elizabeth Costava Foundation, and Traduki, and a 2021 Penheim Translation Fund grant. Her work has appeared in Asymptote, Words Without Borders, Exchanges, and elsewhere. Jana Bukova is a Bulgarian poet and writer living between Sofia and Athens. She is the author of three poetry books, two short story collections, and the novel Traveling in the Direction of the Shadow. Her writing has appeared in Words Without Borders, Best European Fiction, Two Lines, and The Southern Review. Welcome, Ekaterina and Jan. Thank you so much for these introductions. Um, on uh, First of all, on behalf of Jana Bukova and myself, I want to say thanks um, for being included. It's really an honor to be included in this reading um, with these amazing translators and um, authors. Also want to thank everyone who's listening, whose names or faces I can't see, but um, thank you for being here. Uh, it feels, um, I don't know, strange or out of place somehow to be doing a literary reading somehow with everything that's going on in the world. I think for some of us, it's you know just a few hundred kilometers. I mean, not that it matters. Uh, away, but um, at the same time, I do think that um, and still believe that literature has a capacity to sort of, I don't know, make us, um, allow us to make some sort of sense, I guess, of the world uh, and maybe bring some sort of solace, uh, imperfect solace, even in a very inconsolable world. So maybe it's not strange to be reading. Um, Jana, I don't know if you want to say something. Hello, and thank you for the invitation. I wish we were doing this reading in better times. These are dark times for Europe and ugly times. Uh, we've chosen two texts about the world getting upside down and about how things collapse and how never will be the same after that. So, the first one is a poem. It's from my last poetry book, Notes of the Phantom Woman. And it's a poem 
about an earthquake. Земетресение. Земетресението завари господин на кухнята. Стана толкова внезапно, сякаш цялата кооперация се втурна една крачка напред в опита си да хване нещо. Около него чашите се разбиваха в пода, като огромни стъклени нарове. Чуваше се един далечен рев, като от стадион в момента на победата или все едно да надуваха подземните ангели тръбите си в ящниците на земята. Паузата започна да очита леки изменения в пейзажа. Беше най-разтърсващото събитие в живота му, като се изключи онзи след обед на 1974, когато на връщане от работа видя един човек да се хвърля под трамвая. По съвпадение, и тогава слънцето грееше над проточените викове на тълпата. Чувства се готов за ужаса, сякаше официална покана и вече е закопчал и последното копче на ризата си. Слиза по изтъргушеното стълбище с онази неестествено изправена стойка на тялото, която имат възрастните хора, когато искат да покажат, че все още има останало някакво достоинство. Иска да се увери, иска да види с очите си. Наложителността на процедурата, работниците, цялата механика. Before I read the English translation, I just wanted to say a, a few words. Um, so as Jana said, this is a poem from her latest poetry collection, um, Notes of the Phantom Woman, sorry. And it was originally, uh, quite interestingly, written in uh, both Greek and Bulgarian. I mean, it came out as sort of two originals, one in Greek and one in Bulgarian. And Jana says she wrote it at the same time. Neither is a translation of the other. Um, and so we thought it would be an interesting translation project actually to sort of reflect these two originals in one English translation. So the translation I'm reading now is actually done by um, John O'Keen, who was working from the Greek into English, and then me from the Bulgarian into the English. And neither of us has access to the other. So I don't know any Greek. So I only was looking at the uh, Bulgarian. So it was, it's kind of an interesting project, I think, um, that we hope to um, do for the whole poetry book. So the poem is called Earthquake. The earthquake hit when Mr. N was in the kitchen. It occurred so unexpectedly as if the apartment block suddenly sprang two steps forward in an attempt to grab something. All around him, glasses broke on the floor like large crystal pomegranates. A dull roar was heard as from a distant stadium at the moment of victory or as if subterranean angels blew trumpets in the ovaries of the earth. When it stopped, he could see the slight changes to the landscape. It was the most shattering event of his life since that afternoon in 1974, when on his way home from work, he saw a man fall onto the tram tracks. By coincidence, then as now, the sun shone above the crowd's long drawn out cries. He feels ready for the horror, as if it were a formal invitation, and he has just buttoned the last button of his shirt. He descends the demolished stairs with the unnatural upright posture the elderly adopt when trying to show they still possess a modicum of dignity. He wants to know. He wants to see with his own eyes the neglectability of the whole procedure, the workers who carry it out, the mechanism. And um, the other excerpt we're going to read is from um, Yana's novel, Traveling in the Direction of the Shadow. I know somebody asked to see the covers of the book. So this is the Bulgarian edition. Um, it hasn't come out in English yet. We're um, still in the process of looking for a publisher, which we'll hopefully um, find before too long. Um, and we've been working on it um, uh, quite closely together for the past three or four years now. Um, I started working on it in Iowa, then uh, we went to Art Omi together, Yana and I um, had the chance to work on it uh, together there. Um, I was very, very happy to get the support uh, from the Penheim Translation Grant. Um, so yeah, we're still in the process of um, doing that and finishing the novel. Um, so Yana will go ahead first in, uh, with a small excerpt uh, in Bulgarian and then I'll um, reread the same excerpt as her and kind of uh, give you a bigger one in a longer one in English. It's from the fifth 
chapter um, and it's, it's a small excerpt from the fifth chapter and it's about a uh, lighting strike. Телила или втората смърт. Така, измервайки разстоянията, не бива да забравяме, че най-краткият път между две точки в пространството е огънят. Ян Ванатен, изпътуване по посока на сянката. Нейната история започва с дъжда. Всичко се сриваше надолу с дъжда, всичко пропадаше. На бето плота над къщите, облъгът влезе в селото, водата се изля изведнъж, разсипнически, наедри от весни парцали. И се чу как някъде, не много високо, скърцаха, трещяха и се разместваха на бесните плочи. И всеки път, когато за миг се отвореше процеп между тях, можеше да види този, който имаше очи, от какво е направено небето под покритието си. Цялото от жив и на отеложен огън. Chapter 5 Telila or the Second Death And so, when measuring distances, we mustn't forget that the shortest path between two points in space is fire. Jan van Aten in traveling in the direction of the shadow. Her story begins with the rain. Everything was collapsing under the rain. Everything was crumbling. The sky sagged over the houses. The cloud bore down on the village. The water poured out all at once recklessly in large vertical rags. And from somewhere, not too high above, came the creaking, crashing, and shifting of the celestial plates. And whenever a momentary gap opened between them, it became visible. Those who had eyes could see what the sky was made of underneath its covering. It was all living and raging fire. She was 13 then, and they sent her out to fetch something from the shed. The newborn puppies, still blind, were lying under the walnut tree. The rain was jabbing into their tender skin, which shone with wetness while the water drowned them, just a few paces away. With her first step out from beneath the eaves, she was soaked to the bone. Her clothes became heavy, as though she had suddenly grown old. She grabbed the one that was closest, which was black and bigger than the rest, with a white spot on its forehead, as if someone had touched it with the tip of a finger. What if lightning strikes, she thought and looked up. The sky became chalky, then more brilliant than mica, and all the droplets on the wet tree suddenly flashed with their own light and fell soundlessly and melted before they touched her face. She did not even hear the thunder. If this were a nightmare, she would have woken up with her scream in her mouth, like an insect that was still moving about, black and groping. She would have pinched her little sister awake in order to tell her, even though there was nothing to tell. She always dreamed empty dreams of barely lit places, cavernous and echoing between invisible faraway walls with nothing between them, and then something making a smacking sound in this nothingness lying in wait until the terror would grow big enough to wake her. And then she would fill them in order to tell her little sister with all kinds of creatures, slippery, creeping, sticky, many-eyed, until her little sister would start to quietly sob with a warm, sleepy fear that seemed so comfortingly contagious, so much safer than her own empty and echoing terror, that she could relax once again, as though the black insect had never been in her mouth and she could fall asleep, calm and unsuspecting until the next nightmare. But now she lay stretched out on her back, half buried in the soft earth. The rain had split her hair down the middle and spread it over the soil. And the dog was still in her embrace, also stretched out and motionless. The smell of charcoal and burned flesh floated in the air. Something was sizzling. Footsteps were heard splashing around. Someone kept slapping their thighs and wailing. The tree stood split in half and blackened. The lightning had burned the whole litter to ashes. And even before the rain had stopped and the sky had cleared and the birds had come out to sing as if nothing had happened, a voice rose. Low, rustling with a thousand fragmentary exclamations, clicking in satisfaction, feeding on itself, buzzing, flowing and spilling over. 
And there, floating on its surface like a grease stain, was the word miracle. And gone was her sister's abundant childish fear, which had kept her own fear warm in the dark. She now had a bed of her own, as narrow as a corpse's, and she lay in it motionless, with her arms crossed over her chest and the dog under her arms, its heart beating in hers. The room was small, white hot, and low over her head the ceiling sagged, all cracked with time. And between the pieces of plaster, it was visible. She could clearly see what it was made of. It was all darkness, impenetrable darkness. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina. Thank you, Yana. The shortest distance between two points is fire. That's burning in my head. This uh, concludes our, our readings and we do have time for a few q and A. I'm gonna start off with one prepared ahead of time. And if you have additional ones, we encourage you to ask them in the, the q and A. I wanted to ask everyone, can you describe your collaborative process of translation? We've heard about um, two languages, uh, and Greek thrown in. Uh, so it, 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 it's fascinating to hear what goes on between author and translator. Does anybody want to start that? Kenya. Um, yes, um, I sort of dove into the book. I chose I chose Hoffnung in order to translate the first few pages for a translation contest, uh, which I didn't win and wasn't even shortlisted. But by then I had become so enamored by, by Puna Ansari's voice that I just wanted to finish all of it. And I translated it all. And whenever I ran into a problem, because there are many specific Austrian or Viennese slang words, or um, a name of a bank, for instance, which I wasn't familiar with and completely misconstrued, I would communicate with Pune, just for a short answer, or with Nicola Richter, the publisher. And, um, it went through many, many manuscripts because not only did they give me their feedback, I kept giving myself more feedback because I was never really satisfied with the way I interpreted that chaotic voice, that flow of words without, without um, punctuation and, and the many quirks. So I'd say the collaboration really happened after I had finished the translation for myself. Fascinating. And um, piggybacking on that question, you're not off the hook, other readers. Uh, uh, there's a question in the audience about thank you all at Pen America Translation Committee for this delightful reading. My question is to Hannah and Salome. I remember Hannah's excitement in my translation workshops beginning to work on this project. I delighted watching her work persistently on this translation. I would like to hear from Salome about her experience working with Hannah. And I would like to hear from Hannah about reflecting on this change from solitude to solidarity with Salome. Thank you. And I'm afraid I'm going to mispronounce the author's name oh this yes. is savinch turkan thank yes. you yes, yes exactly <laughs> thank you nancy and thank you professor turkan was actually the first person i told about this project and she helped me so much guiding me so i'm, I'm really touched to have her here today and for the question unfortunately salome had to leave us for another commitment but i will just say that in the beginning Salome and I corresponded about, you know, whether the rights were available, the very typical conversations that translators have with their authors. 
and we were not necessarily talking about questions that I had related to the novel. And in the process, I've had the opportunity to meet Salome in person, and we've developed a really wonderful friendship. And I think being able to know, because the book that she's written is this work of autofiction, it's very personal, and to know the concerns that she has in life, her, you know, this obsession with time and childhood and the relationship between the reader and the author and the writer and where the translator fits into that place, I think has been able to clarify my role as a translator. I've had the opportunity in this book not only to become this eternally absent other, but also to play the writer. And it's put me in this position that I, you know, Salome in the in the excerpt that we read uses the word monodialogue. And I think that's a really beautiful way to think of the translation process. You know, it starts off as this monologue, it's just the author. And it, through the translation, you try to highlight, or this was one of my goals, try, try to highlight aspects of the text that were already original and add my own voice so that it's somewhere in between between. It's not quite a dialogue, not quite a monologue, but exactly this idea of monodialogue. Other folks who we haven't heard from who'd like to comment about this easy question, they get harder, about your collaboration. Maybe I can say a, a few more uh, words if that's okay. I mean, I, I, I already said a little bit that we've been working quite closely for a few years now on um, the translation of Yana's novel. Uh, but I think it's interesting and worth mentioning that um, Yana is also in addition to a poet and um, an author, she's also a translator. Um, and I think that's, um, I mean, I don't know. I think she, she's really a dream to work with, probably not just for this reason, but um, people who have worked with uh, authors who are as well translators, I think probably can testify that it's, um, I don't know, it's really <laughs> nice in a way, uh, because I think, um, I mean, first of all, she speaks English fluently, so she has a really a sense of what I'm doing in the translation. Uh, but also, I think she has a sense of, um, you know, what's at stake with, with the translation project, you know, how translation uh, works. And I think that really makes a huge difference um, when you're working with an author. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, um, specific methods that it's been very interesting to um, work on her poetry collection with John O'Keefe, as I said, this, you know, process from the two, from two very different languages, um, from two originals. And then the uh, working on the novel has been uh, very different. But I think most of the time I do like a very pretty rough translation for myself and then mark, you know, things that are unclear, things that I um, want to discuss with her and then, you know, bring that to Yana. That's for the book. And then for the poetry collection, it's very interesting because Yana is actually the only person who speaks all three languages. Uh, you know, Greek, Bulgarian, and English. So she, when whenever there's some sort of disagreement between um, John O'Keefe and myself, she's sort of the arbiter in a way um, about what to do. It gets even more complicated with um, the, the two languages there, yeah. Uh, the same question, but slanted a little differently because it's a question from the audience. This is from Magda, and it's really for Sean, but he has a class to teach. Uh, so the question is first, congratulations on a superb translation on being finalist for pen translation. Secondly, great text selection for today, the actual dialogue between the feminine voice of the Romanian author and the masculine one of the American translator. Okay. Really brought to the fore the dialogic nature of translation. My question is about how did it feel to be translating a book staged as a dialogue between a woman and man where we only hear the woman's voice? In what way was this experience different from when you translated men authors? So that, that part, Magna has not translated the men authors, but she can certainly speak to the, the first part, I hope. Thank you for the question. Sean ha had to leave, so um, I'll be alone <laughs> to answer this uh, commentary. 
Um, it was an interesting experience to have a, a male translated uh, for this book, uh, especially because Sean was the one to come towards me and to invite me, to propose me to translate this book. And uh, I was a little bit amazed because uh, the book uh, is, is not so easy to grasp or to swallow for a man, I think. And I had some problems in Romania with it, to, be, uh, to put it uh, sincerely, as uh, some male literary critics or philosophers uh, who read the book were shocked. They said that they were shocked by the images or the visions uh, described in the book. While with Sean, I had a, a nice experience, a, a balanced one. And I think uh, it was a, an experience first for Sean, as he was obliged to put himself into the uh, person of a woman uh, from childhood to adulthood. And uh, uh, maybe it was not easy for him, but he, he told me that he was convinced to do this translation when he read uh, a scene in which I describe um, uh, the first menstruation of a young girl. And he was convinced by this scene, can you imagine? And um, because the scene is dramatic, in fact. Um, and uh, there are also others, other scenes of this kind in the book. And it's, it's a delicate issue and question to accept it as a man, but he did it very nicely and generously. And I felt that at the end, he, uh, he felt himself enriched by, by this translation because he was obliged to assume and to internalize uh, specific feminine experiences which were not common for a man. And uh, now that uh, this experience um, is already written in FEM in this book, I have the idea to pass on the other uh, side of the river and to write about a man, uh, the experiences of a man from my point of view. And uh, to have in this way um, um, a, a complete experience, because I think that, um, men and women, we have to have a complete experience of the other sex in order to become complete uh, personalities. So that's it. Thank you. And that question was brought to you by Letitia. And we have um, a question by Janet. Sylvester, Mari and Celia, how did you, how did the graphic images influence the translation of the works in Okti? Thank you for the question. That was actually the exact question I wanted to answer. <laughs> so pretty perfect. Um, for me personally, Mari's beautiful art gave me the courage to actually take the job because I usually translate only from English into Finnish. And I was hesitating a bit if, if I should take the job when it was offered to me and then I saw some of the pages and I thought wow this is so beautiful I want to be part of this and I want to help convey it to new readers and from my point of view at least the sort of visual storytelling in the book is so strong that it carries much of the story on its own so in a way I had less pressure <laughs> for the translation but of course it's always when you're translating a graphic novel you have to be really careful and see what the images are saying and then sort of build the words from there. I can uh, also add um add to that that uh, Celia actually did uh, for the Finnish version, the original version uh, in the book we have subtitles in every uh, every uh, page in English actually 
So in the end of the page, there's this like an English translation for it. So Celia did that also. And um, and then like when I heard that this, oh, I was able to get this in English, I was so happy that Celia was able to do the final translation, which is always like, it is a different, it is kind of like in the movies, like the subtitles and the dubbing in a way that uh, you're going to have to do a different kind of uh, translation for it. But it was so, it was really nice that Celia was doing that. And uh, I've been doing some like translations for my own comics to English sometimes, but I was so happy that Celia did this because like there was, I, I've always felt like, cause I'm not a translator. So it's kind of like, I always feel like there's something missing. Like I can't, like there's something that I can't really like portray even though there isn't that many words in the page, but maybe that's why it's, it is exactly so difficult because then like the translator, Celia had to like really like think what this one word would be <laughs> in this. And it was really, really, um, yeah, I was really happy that, that Celia did that. And she was able to kind of find those nuances that I was kind of like struggling with English myself. But then when I read it, I was just like, yeah, well, of course, like this is, this is how it should be. <laughs> yes, yeah, succeeding that, that small area there is a, a, a comic and yet each word just resonates in your heart, uh, you know, the, 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 the dramatic reading with again, you want to hear this again, okay. okay. Uh, we're getting close to our end, but I wanted to circle back to Yana, and I wanted to ask you as a translator yourself, as well as juggling your Greek translator and your Bulgarian translator, how, how is that experience for you? It was one. Uh, it is a wonderful experience working with the Katarina. It was, I don't know. It was. Uh, it was a gift for me. Uh, one of the things which always uh, 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 made me uh, very uh, emotional is how the English text keeps all the rhythm and the pauses and the, uh, the intuition of the Bulgarian text. It, it, it's absolutely lovely for me as a writer. So I'm really grateful that I have this chance to work together. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of our program. Um, I want to thank our hosts again, Pen America and the Pen Translation Committee and uh, Aliyah Gato, who's making the tech possible because I couldn't. <laughs> My co-organizer and co-moderator, Marguerite Feitlowitz and Catherine Young, our co-organizer. Also thanks to Alta Price as our introducer. And thanks to the readers again for such beautiful and moving voices from all over the globe. Um, and most importantly, the audience that we had people to read to. So we, we truly appreciate your coming here because that energizes us to know that you're out there. I wanted to let you know that both of these um, events, the one from February 28th and today's reading will be on the Penn website as recordings. And um, I also want to uh, mention that we hope to see you in August when we have Women in Translation Month and we're hopefully planning some readings to celebrate. Thank you so much. <laughs>